we found that we found that there's when we looked at the equations com combined the electron acoustic way uh, I'm sorry when we combined the continuity equation and the momentum equation for the case where only the electrons were mobile which means a very high frequency and the ions were static or just not moving providing a uniform background that when we did that we got what look what is in the form of a wave equation and we recognize uh, this quantity as being a sound speed and this being a plasma frequency and so it looks like this so this is standard uh, wave equation longitudinal wave equation and uh, the finite amplitude waves can exist without any uh, driving function you know you don't have to put a, an electric field axial longitudinal electric field in there with some wires or something to launch it this is just a natural mode and uh, this is the operators and then assuming a certain our usual waveform um, we got this waveform we got this dispersion relationship okay so that the frequency of this wave is the omega p squared plus k squared times the sound speed and it looks like this and it's actually quite flat for a long long way out it doesn't it doesn't change a whole lot here and so that was the electron acoustic wave and then for the transverse wave which we looked at before um, in uh, the high harmonic chapter the last few slides we did this because we wanted to have for the high harmonic people a simple close to one page um, development of what the refractive index was for the transverse wave. But anyway, going through that same sort of logic or process, I should say, um, we got this for the transverse electric field and a transverse electromagnetic wave. Looks like this. And there was an error, but rather than uh, fix it properly, I just note this was supposed to be have a subscript E where this is the electron density. So the plasma frequency depends on the electron density. Okay. And so again, from this, you get this dispersion relationship. You assume a wave of this form. And from this equation, you get a relationship between omega and K. K is two pi over lambda. So this is a relationship. Um, between the two and, and um, it graphs this way, but you can also get a refractive index out of this by uh, writing omega over K, okay? And you can get a refractive index. Anyway, this is the electromagnetic wave. And what's interesting is at high enough frequency where omega squared is much bigger than omega P squared, okay? Um, uh, then omega p doesn't matter so much or it's a small correction and you get to omega is equal to kc so it's like propagating in vacuum if you get well enough above the plasma frequency but on the other hand if you're looking at a small k down here in this region here for very small k k is 2 pi over lambda so that means really long wavelength so this is the long wavelength electromagnetic wave okay and in that case, uh, when k goes to zero, you find that you can't propagate at a frequency below omega p, okay? It's not possible. And that, uh, the, that the electron density, which corresponds to omega just equal to omega p, that electron density is called the critical electron density. And at that point, if it had an electromagnetic wave coming into a plasma which had increasing electron density, when it reached a critical density, it would be reflected back. Okay? There might be a lot of absorption, but there'd be a reflection. And so this is, a, this is about what happens when we have such a plasma, so-called overdense plasma, where omega p becomes equal or larger than omega. So we take the dispersion relationship and we solve for k, and we want to find out, is K real? Is this a propagating wave where K is real? Or does this turn imaginary? And so this is the equation, whoops, um, here. So K, so just solving this, it's omega squared minus omega P squared, square root over C. And you see that when omega is less than omega P, the solution for K is imaginary. 
And so just in the limit where it's quite small, but it doesn't have to be quite small, you can figure this out. But uh, in that simple case, the K, the imaginary K is omega P over C. So this is telling you that that wave would not propagate in this so-called overdense plasma. Electron density is a little too, is too high, okay? And this is the penetration depth, okay? <coughs> so, and this is a, this is a, a well-known result for light shining on, let's say, an, uh, um, a piece of aluminum or something, or a piece of copper or something. This, you would use this same analysis and there's a, there's, an elect, there's a conduction electron density. And if you use that to find that on omega p, you'd get a penetra you, you would find what is the penetration depth of, let's say, uh, some laser um, into a metallic surface. And it decays very quickly, OK? So, uh, so I'm going to give you some examples here of this critical electron density, just so you get a handle on it. Um, so here's our dispersion relationship as before. Here's our definition. It's also missing a subscript E. Uh, so let me fix that too. What's up? Okay. And uh, so when omega is just equal to omega p, well, we know what omega p is. We saw that we, that popped up or that evolved naturally in the wave equation. Uh, when omega is just equal to omega p, the electron density is defined by that relationship. And so you just substitute this in here and you'll get this is the critical electron density. And it depends on omega squared or if you wish inversely on lambda squared. And so this is a, uh, this is an example, putting numbers into it, into this for all of the natural constants, you get that the critical density is this 1.11 times 10 to the 21 electrons per centimeter cube. So if lambda was, a, if this was a Thai sapphire uh, laser, the way, and this brackets means you just put in the numbers here. So for Thai sapphire, let's say at 800 nanometers, this would be 0 0.8 squared, so 0.64, so what is this? This is going to say that the critical density for Thai sapphire is something like 1.6 times 10 to the 21 electrons per cubic centimeter. So if you shine that on some plasma, which has a lower electron density, it'll go through, propagate. But if you shine your laser on um, a plasma that has a density of 10 to the 22 or is higher, it's gonna reflect off. So there's a bouncing or a reflection, perhaps with absorption, um, but it, there's going to be it. And there are some examples down here I put in of some examples. So for a neodymium laser with a uh, 1.06 micron uh, wavelength, the critical density um, is, roughly one times 10 to the 21. And for a CO2 laser, which has a 10, a 10 times longer wavelength, this goes as lambda squared. So the critical density is 10 to the 19th. So for instance, in this, um, these um, laser produced plasmas that are used for the EUV lithography, they're driven by a 10 micron laser, 10.6 micron laser. And so they have these, um, these little tin droplets, which are coming down, they shoot them down, drops, one coming in, there's a laser pulse from the CO2 laser, ionizes them. That laser pulse, CO2 laser pulse, only goes into a criti uh, that critical density of 10 to the 19th. And if it isn't all absorbed, it's reflected back. So I th we have a few slides at the end because that turns out to be one of the most, um, mm, it's an important application of plasma physics amongst the current science and technology because the making of the computer chips is such a big deal. Okay. Uh, and, but and so you could have put in here the Thai sapphire uh, laser. And by the way, harmonics of neodymium. So uh, the fourth harmonic of neodymium shown here would go into a higher density up to 10 to the 22. Okay. Uh, interestingly, 
you could do this also for radio waves. So here's um, uh, between AM and FM radio, there's, um, so what is this frequency? Uh, nine megahertz. So this has to be an FM. Is this right? Nine, nine megahertz. So FM goes up to, let's say, 100 megahertz. I forget how low it goes. But anyway, AM and FM radios are much lower frequencies or longer, much longer wavelengths. So the critical density is a lot lower. Okay. And um, for instance, um, if you're um, far from the cities, um, far from the cities, driving in your car and you have on your AM or FM radio, you'll find that far from the cities, you don't get any AM. It just doesn't propagate that far and it gets absorbed. But you will pick up some FM stations. So for instance, if you go, you're driving towards Yosemite or something, or on the other side, better, of, of, the, of the, uh, um, the Sierra Nevadas, um, you won't get any AM unless you happen to be near a little town that has a station, but you might pick up FM from Los Angeles. And the reason you would pick it up is because their broadcast would be at a frequency that is um, such that the FM, how does this go? I got it all wrong. Uh, the FM, you would not pick up any FM whatsoever, but you might pick up an AM station from Los Angeles because it has a low enough frequency that it bounces off the ionosphere. So surrounding the Earth's atmosphere, there's a layer of ions and electrons called the ionosphere, okay? And um, during the, the nighttime, when the sun has gone down and it's not heating the atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere, the, the oxygen and nitrogen, the Earth's atmosphere, the gases contract a bit and they leave a nice ionization and electron layer above it. And AM radio can, go, can come and reflect off it and go back and cover a great distance, okay? Uh, but the, um, uh, during the day, the Earth's, uh, the sun's heat, uh, the sun's light heats the atmosphere and the oxygen and nitrogen gas expands, the atmosphere expands, and it expands up into the ionosphere, and it makes for a very lossy reflection. So you don't get the AM reflection um, during the day, but you do get it at night, and it covers great distances because it's reflecting off the ionosphere, which is up pretty high, okay? Uh, for the FM, this never works because the FM frequency is so high, it just goes through the ionosphere no matter what. It's, it's above the critical density. So, okay. Um, yeah, also on the comment about re-entry vehicles. So, uh, re so if some astronauts are out, uh, some space station and they come back into the Earth's atmosphere, when they're coming back in, they're going at a phenomenal velocity. And when they, when they reach into the Earth's atmosphere, they're creating a plasma by heating it. The, just the impact of the vehicle on the, on the oxygen, nitrogen, does a lot of, heats it a great deal, produces a lot of ionization, and there's a, there's a blackout. So there's a short period where you, there's no connection. The people inside the capsule, return capsule, can't hear ground, and ground here can't hear them, and I forget how long it lasts, but it's enough, used to be enough that everyone was very nervous about this whole thing, okay? Uh, but anyway, it's a common thing. And that's, it all has to do with this critical electron density. Okay, uh, so that was if omega is less than omega p. If omega is greater than omega p, then there is a real propagating wave and it has a phase velocity, which you can compute from this and our dispersion relationship, which you can write in the following fashion or in terms of the electron density over the critical electron density. Either way, these, these go as the, the square. Okay, and so you get a refractive index n. This n with nothing on it means it's a, no subscripts. It is a, a refractive index, okay? And so it's C over V phase. That's how we define um, phase velocity. 
And this is it. So this is the refractive index of a plasma in general, or equivalently in terms of the electron density, th this works just fine. And <coughs> in the case where this is relatively small, where the electron density is well below the critical, okay, um, which would be the case for high harmonics, for instance, the electron densities are not nearly equal to the critical density for tie sapphire. So if this is small, the, the square root is just one, one minus a half, okay? Okay, where again, this is the critical density. Is there any comment on that from anybody? So, okay, so the high harmonic people, I hope are okay then with using one of these relationships and, um, Uh, what are we saying here? Oh, yeah, just to comment on the fact that the, the, this was the phase velocity. Uh, the group velocity, we don't talk about, haven't talked about so much, but rather than be omega over k, it's the partial of omega with respect to k, and it looks like this. So one of them is less than c, and one of them is greater than c, okay? And uh, the phase velocity, that's the, you know, if you think of this monochromatic wave, uh, it is the speed or the it is the velocity with which the crest and the whole wave are moving, okay? And um, you can see it can be greater than C depending on, on the electron density. So, and this, is, this was, by the way, was the issue for the high harmonics. If the electron density gets too high, the phase velocity of the, of the tie sapphire wave will become much greater than C. So where, the, where there's a high electron density, the phase velocity will become large and it will, be, it will limit the ability to match the, the phase velocity of the tie sapphire with the harmonics that you're producing. The, the tie sapphire will start running ahead of the harmonics and it'll start producing harmonic radiation, which is out of phase with what it had produced at the beginning when it entered the gas, okay? So this is, this is a, a limiting, can be a limiting factor for uh, high harmonic generation. How, how long of a propagation path can you have could be limited. And it's also a negative lensing effect. The, um, uh, it, it will wind up producing a divergent radiation. The group velocity, on the other hand, as I said, is the partial of omega with respect to g. And the group velocity depends on, the group velocity describes the, the case where you have a lot of wavelengths involved. So again, phase velocity is for monochromatic light, what is the phase velocity? Group velocity is when you have a bunch of, a bunch of wavelengths, let's say near each other, and um, uh, for one reason or another, they're propagating at different speeds. And so the group velocity uh, is this, and the group velocity is associated with um, either transport of information, like uh, information, music, or data, or um, energy. And so Einstein would tell us that this always has to be less than C, and it is. The group velocity is always less than C, that has to do with the transport of information, data, or energy. The phase velocity, there's no limitation on phase velocity. It can be anything, okay? In fact, if you think of waves incident on a surface, um, they can easily have very high phase velocities. Any comments on that? Actually, it's usually a tricky issue. Yeah, I'm having trouble processing that any velocity can be greater than C, mm -hmm. like physically. What does that mean for the phase velocity to be greater than C? Okay, I'm gonna give you an example, but don't forget for X-rays and, and much of EUV, the phase velocity is also greater than C. But let's see, um, suppose you had an ocean wave, imagine some sequence of waves coming onto a surface, you know, the sand, reaching the sand at some angle, okay? You could ask, what is the phase velocity of that wave along the interface between the water and the sand? Okay, and so it's, an, it's a water wave. It's gonna be quite slow, okay? But as you change the angle 
of this water wave, this ocean wave, to be closer and closer to the normal, the phase velocity along this interface, even for water waves, if they were well enough defined, can also be greater than C. So, um, again, it doesn't violate any rules. We, ha we don't have any rules that say that a wave is limited to C. We only have rules that about the group velocity, about energy, you know, mass, mass and energy equivalent, nothing, you know, they, they cannot exceed C in the medium that they're in, actually, to be um, properly correct, right? But anyway, the, the, that's where the limitations are. Information, energy cannot go faster. But the phase velocity, it's just, you know, a, a simple electromagnetic wave, quasi-monochromatic, let's say, and those, there are just no limits on that crest. And it sort of depends on geometry, on phase velocity in what direction. You know? okay. Oh, so this is just a, about the group. Uh, this is showing, for instance, this heavy black line is one wavelength, okay? And so, and that wave is moving along at a certain velocity, a certain phase velocity. And then there's another wavelength which is shown, which is a little bit longer wavelength, and it's the light line, okay? And the, the two of them are propagating, but they're not propagating at the same phase velocity. So at a certain time when you're looking at them, they may line up in a certain place, okay? Um, uh, and that will be more intense, okay? So the, the modulation envelope will be maximum here, but over a little bit further, one wave is at a maximum, the other one is not at a maximum. In fact, here they're completely orthogonal. So there's an envelope that travels with the peak, okay? It's not traveling with either of the waves, it's just an envelope that has some maximum and it, that envelope is moving. Okay, and so the phase, these waves, these black lines are all propagating at C, uh, or I'm sorry, one is propagating at C and one is propagating at a slightly uh, different wavelength, okay? And at different times, at a certain position, the diff and at different times are evolving in time, this modulation envelope will maximize and decrease and maximize and decrease. And it's that modulation envelope that travels with the group velocity. Okay. Um, and this is just to say that we've uh, ignored, in all of the plasma equations, the fluid equations we had up to now, I ignored collision frequencies. So for instance, the transverse wave coming through uh, a plasma, we said, well, it's gonna make the electrons oscillate up and down, and that's gonna, which shows up in our Maxwell's equations, and we solve when we got a dispersion relation. But in the, in the momentum equation, we could have put in a term to account for collisions. So for instance, I said the ions were there just spread out uniformly just for charge distribution neutrality, but um, we didn't say about anything about the interactions with the electrons in the ions. But it could be that as the wave comes through and it makes the electrons oscillate up and down, which we've already accounted for, it could be that some of those electrons come close to one of the ions and they get diverted, sent in a new direction. There's just a scattering of the electron, which would lead to Bremsstrahlung. But at any rate, that electron is no longer part of the coherent wave that was oscillating up and down. So there's one less electron oscillating in the wave, and as a result, the wave is going to decrease in amplitude. So if you have a lot of collisions between the free electrons oscillating in the electric field of the wave, the, uh, the transverse wave, and a lot of them are interacting, colliding with the ions, you're gonna lose energy. And so you can, you can easily account for that and by in introducing a collision frequency. And so this is the electron, uh, nu is the collision frequency between electrons and ions. If, a, if it was a, 
and this is for a, a highly ionized plasma. If there were a lower ionization, for instance, some of these plasma, uh, atmospheric plasmas, it could be that you need to account for collisions between the electrons and the neutrals also. So there can be different kind of collision frequencies and you can put them into your, what's equivalent to a Navier-Stokes equation, but put them into the momentum equation. And if you do, your dispersion relationship will be modified. This is what it was we saw before, but now there's uh, an absorptive term here, okay? So that's the collision frequency. And um, if you set the frequency omega having a real part and an imaginary part, this will be the solution for the real part, just like we saw before, but now there's an imaginary part and it looks like this, okay? And so this is telling us that the wave or e to the, uh, e to the minus i omega t, there's gonna be a damping term. And this is the damping term due to the collision frequency, okay? Uh, and also you could certainly have a magnetic field. And if you have a magnetic field, the electrons um, will, os will um, um, they'll circulate around the magnetic fields with a cyclotron frequency EB over M, B being the measure of the magnetic field. And so it'll do a cyclotron frequency if so here's a magnetic field, let's say it's in the vertical direction. If an electron is moving this way, it'll feel a V cross B in the Lorentz term, and it will circulate around the magnetic field. That's if it's coming orthogonal to the magnetic field, and it'll circulate with this frequency, EB over M. If the electron is going um, parallel to the magnetic field, the Lorentz force is zero. The V cross B, there's no cross product. So it's only for the orthogonal direction. And if you put this, this in and you redo all of these plasma equations, you'll find out that the dispersion relation can become a zoo of uh, modifications to what we saw earlier. And there'll be, for instance, if the electron is running in a direction that's along the magnetic field, there's no effect. Okay, you get the same plasma wave that you had before, but if it's at uh, 90 degrees, the electron motion is limited at 90 degrees. And so it changes the waves that can propagate. At what, it changes the frequencies at which waves propagate, okay? And the, so these things have names, a cyclotron resonance for the low frequencies, a hybrid resonance, which combines the plasma frequency and the cyclotron frequency. Etc. So for people who were interested in, let's say, solar physics, this would be an absolute essential to include all of the magnetic fields uh, because the magnetic fields and the solar atmosphere just dominate the dynamics. Okay. Does anyone want to throw a comment in? No? Nope. <laughs> Okay, um, I put this in last year. I don't know how much I wanna say about it now, but we're talking about longitudinal plasma waves. So uh, this was just some comment about acoustical waves, sound waves are longitudinal. So when, when someone is speaking to you, uh, you're modulating the, uh, the density of, of the air and that modulation is what's propagating to you as an acoustical wave. So not a transverse electromagnetic wave, but an acoustical wave where coming towards you, propagating towards you is a density modulation, pressure modulation. Okay, so that's your longitudinal wave. And the electron and ion acoustic waves are examples. Uh, water waves are also um, longitudinal in nature. And a sort of interesting thing is shallow water waves. So when you, when you analyze water waves, this is not a plasma phenomenon, you wind up find, you find that the, the velocity of the wave depends on the depth of the water, okay? And um, for shallow waves, so for deep water waves, the, the waves just propagate. So that's what you see when you're way out in the ocean. They just, this wave is 
water wave is just going on and on. But when you're looking at the coastline, you see something different. Near the coast, the wave starts to break. And what it is, is that in shallow water waves, you find that the phase velocity of the wave depends on the depth, okay? And as you come into the surface, the depth is becoming, because the, the surface underneath, the sand underneath the water is at an angle and you're coming towards, the, the wave is coming towards the coast and it's going from a, a not deep, but a, a, a certain depth to a less and less a depth. And as the depth gets smaller, the, the phase velocity gets greater. And so uh, you wind up getting that the, the top of the wave starts to go faster. I'm sorry. The, the phase velocity winds up, yeah, uh, I have an equation in a moment. But anyway, this is what produces the breaking of a wave. Let me see if the relationship, oh, it's not there. Okay. Uh, enough said. Sir, and I also I would also add that in, in this conversation, that's um, that's why the a tsunami wave, right? When you're in a deep ocean, uh, it doesn't doesn't seem as destructive as it is when it starts going to the coastline. It's the same phenomena due to the phase velocity and the and the water depth changing drastically. Absolutely, and thank you for adding that. And in fact, the surprising thing is that those waves actually are shallow water waves, even though they're way out in the ocean. And it's because, for instance, an earthquake shakes everything, shakes the water above it. And uh, it turns out that the earthquake has such a broad lateral dimension that even though you're in deep, what we would think of as deep water, deep ocean water, that ocean water thickness is less than the extent of the earthquake shaking the ground underneath it. So it turns out that even, even way out at sea, you produce this tsunami, it is in fact a shallow water wave. And as it approaches the surface, this phenomena of the top of the wave racing ahead. So you can have waves which not too far offshore seem sort of like, okay, there's a big wave coming. But as it gets closer and closer, the top of the wave starts going faster and it really moves faster. It all of a sudden is racing towards the shore at a higher velocity. So, so thank you for bringing that up. It's, um, it's all captured under shallow water wave theory. Okay, so now some things about, about x-rays. Um, observed x-ray spectra for different targets. So um, I'll tell you in a moment about a bit about black body radiation as a quick estimate of what kind of plasma temperatures you're going to have. Not perfect. You really should use, you really want to use sophisticated simulations, but it is amazing how much you can get out of that sim those two simple formulas for black body radiation. Uh, I'll show you some example of, for soft x-rays, about how we do or how people do time resolve um, x-rays in sort of broad channels. Uh, the, uh, for astronomy, this is quite a common thing, but even for laser-produced plasmas, um, uh, it's also a common thing. Uh, we'll see line spectra. I'll, I mentioned to you about the bottlenecks. We'll look at it again. Um, uh, an example of where you want to produce a strong line spectra in the kilovolt region and how we used um, titanium illumination high intensity illumination of a titanium target. So I think titanium is Z equals 22 or something like that. And uh, you strip off all but two electrons and you get this ionization bottleneck, okay? You can't ionize any further. And then there's really strong emission at 4.7 keV. And people can use that then as a probe. So you might have some little titanium disc that you illuminate and, you, and the, use the 4.7 keV x-rays to probe a nearby plasma, as in a laser fusion plasma, for instance. Um, okay. Uh, we'll make some more comments about nonlinear processes and the generation of superthermal electrons, um, uh, about the hard x-ray continuum that may uh, come because of that. 
and also the fact that um, if you have high enough intensity, if you have very high intensities, like 10 to the 15th watts per centimeter squared, or 10 to the 16th watts per centimeter squared, so a lot higher intensity than you would for high harmonic generation, and put that onto a target, you can generate some enormously high energy electrons, fractions of an MeV. I've seen them myself. <coughs> so let me see where some of these are. So um, I would say you could read this. I'm going to tell you what the highlights are, but basically you could read this in the chapter. But uh, it has to do with a Planckian distribution, which, which we associate with equilibrium. And uh, that Planckian distribution called black body radiation, we go through starting with the conventional way of writing what is the emission from a black body and modify it to our own needs because we normally deal with brightness. And so converting those relationships, we can get a formula for the, the brightness or the spectral brightness of black body radiation and compare it to, for instance, a synchrotron, a bending magnet on a synchrotron. Actually, the brightness is quite high. Okay. So for instance, here's a formula. And if you had, um, you know, a bending magnet at the ALS would have a spectral brightness of something like, what, 10 to the 13th, I think, in these units. Okay, photons per second, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but here you can see that if you had a plasma with a temperature of 100 EV, that's 10 to the 2 cubed, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 17th, you can actually get extremely bright, spectrally bright plasmas. And uh, in this formula, if you look for its optimum, where does it peak? You know, this is the Planckian uh, <coughs> function. It, it, it peaks at 2.8 kappa t. So if kappa t is 100 eV, it's going to peak at 280. Um, in the synchrotron case, for EUV lithography, not synchrotron, in the EUV lithography uh, example at 13.5 nanometers, which corresponds to a photon energy of 92 eV, this tells you that you would need a temperature of like 30 eV. So you can do some I mean, you just get that real quick. It was so easy. We need a temperature that's roughly 30 eV would put it at the peak of the temperature uh, of this profile. And uh, boy, that turns out to be pretty good estimate. So this is this, again, just further going from developing it in terms of brightness, in terms of intensity and the like. The intensity of a black body radiation seen through a little hole. This is the black body inside. It's in equilibrium with the walls at some temperature. The wall is at that temperature. And if we peek at what comes out here, this is the intensity we would see, which we normally write as sigma t to the fourth, where this is the Stefan Boltzmann constant written in terms of degrees of temperature. But we like to deal with electron volts. So we could modify this to look like what we call sigma with a carrot on top, where this is the carrot, okay? And um, uh, so just natural constants here. And so um, the intensity, again, scaling as t to the fourth. So um, the intensity out of your fireplace, fireplace has kind of got a low temperature, so it's not too intense. But if you increase the temperature, in one way or another, it's going to go up quickly. And um, this is an example, and it's a good, ex it's a convenient example. If you have a temperature of 100 eV, the intensity comes out to be 10 to the 13th watts per centimeter squared. So it's kind of interesting number for the, um, for that uh, EUV lithography, we were saying, well, we need a temperature like 30 eV. So it's down a factor of three but it depends on the fourth power. So it's three to the fourth power, it's 100. We'll need an intensity of 10 to the 11th watts per centimeter squared. Well, how convenient. That's telling us when we irradiate those little, uh, little tin droplets that are coming down for the EUV lithography, we only want an intensity from the CO2 laser of about 10 to the 11th watts per centimeter squared. 
we don't want to go any higher than that. If we go higher than that, we're just going to produce higher energy photons, which is not what we want. We want 13.5 nanometers. So these numbers, uh, so this little scaling and the T to the fourth dependence just tell us right away our intensity should be about 10 to the 11th watts per centimeter squared in order to get a 30 eV plasma, which would have a peak at just around 90 eV. So that would tell us, okay, when we go in the lab, let's start with 10 to the 11th, and we'll increase it a little and decrease it a little and see what, where do we get the most power out at the wavelength we want. But this is a great start in what we would call scaling of plasmas. Um, so that's all I was going to say about that. Um, I have used this in many cases for laser produced plasmas. I know in the end, for really understanding things in detail, I really need to use simulations and a lot of different kinds of measurements. But this, um, this little scaling thing works really well as a first cut. Uh, this is just showing, well, how could you measure the temperature of a laser-produced plasma? Um, how could you get an idea of its temperature? Well, there's a couple of things you could do. This is a street camera. So this is the conventional street camera we talked about once before. The high we talked about the high harmonic version of this. But uh, in this case, x-rays are going through some mirrors and filters. Mirrors are sort of uh, low... Um, Mirrors are low pass, filters are high pass, they give you a little notch filter. And so in this way, you could get three different windows of what the temperature is, and that would give you three shots at estimating a temperature. But how do you get that time resolved? So these x-rays are hitting a photocathode here, and on the back side of the photocathode, electrons are coming off. There's a strong uh, axial fi electric field that accelerates the electrons, all electrons, towards the end of the tube where there's a phosphor. And those electrons, if nothing else happened, they would be accelerated, they'd hit the phosphor, and they would emit light on the other side, which you'd capture with a camera or CCD. Okay. And, um, but as those electrons are pulled off here and pulled along, you have, um, a vertical field is applied, a strong vertical field, so that the earliest electrons, let's sort of coming off here, would come and hit the phosphor first, that would be at the bottom, but later, later x-rays producing later electrons would come, would be, arrive later, and this vertical field would displace them up, that's the streaking, and so, as if the electrons from this little darkest area here, this would be the earliest electrons, the peak, and then the tail, okay? And you can do this in three different channels and you'll get three different cuts of the emission and you can use those three, three tags to sort of give you some idea of what the temperature was. You could also have an imaging device here and put an image of something here and see how the image evolves in time, okay? Um, so that's, anyway, so this is a case where you'd use th three so-called channels which combine a reflection off a mirror, a glancing incidence mirror, combined with a filter where the characteristics of the mirror reflectivity, remember it cuts off all the high stuff, so it's just got the low stuff, and then a filter which has an, an absorption edge, and you combine that with the uh, uh, in a way that um, uh, uh, it gives you a notch where the filter is, and the combination of the two will give you a little bit of a window. Maybe it's shown here. Oh yeah, here we go. So for one of those, any one of those things, here's a mirror reflectivity which falls off at higher photon energy, and it's combined with an absorption filter, which it, uh, has an absorption edge, absorbs a great deal below that, and then well above the absorption edge, the filter is just like butter. The x-rays go right through. So if you combine the two of these, you can get uh, this kind of filter reflector, which has a sort of a low Q, if you know, if we, you know Q as in an electrical circuit. Um, 
it has a, a band pass. In this case, a typical band pass would be like four. Okay, E over delta E, or delta E over E would be one fourth. So it's not a fine grading, but it's a really simple and commonly used technique. Okay. And for instance, this is an example of how three such channels were used um, to measure the time, emission time um, of a plasma. So this was illuminating a gold disc with neodymium doubled, which would be green light, two omega. This is uh, the, the pulse, the laser pulse at two omega, so at 0 0.53 micron, has, has a full width at half max of two, 680 picoseconds, so a fraction of a nanosecond. This was the intensity, this was the diameter, and the x-rays rise very rapidly with the heating, but then, they, then even after the laser is turned off, which would be something like this, the plasma is hot. It takes a while to cool, and it goes like this. And in fact, in cooling, because it's cooling, there'll be more, the, the higher en energy part of it, the 600 EV channel, will drop off very quickly, okay? But the, the, t the lowest channel here, 200 EV, actually, as it's cooling, energy that would have been in these regions is coming out here. And so this is going to be mostly the, the cooling part. Um, so it's going to be dominated by lower energy photons, more like 200 EV, whereas here you'd have a mixture. And you can combine those into sort of an equivalent radiation temperature, which is shown here. Okay. So this is again, intensities around 10 to the 15th, you see that you can get plasma temperatures up around 200 EV. Okay. Does anyone want to comment on that? I actually had a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, what is there any sort of function they use to go from the individual radiated power per channel to this aggregate equivalent spectrum? Um, Here? Or is it just a simple addition? Yeah, when they go from the three plots to the singular one, is it just simple addition or is there more going on there? There's a little bit more going on actually, yeah. Because um, there are various things that you have to do for among other things, you have to normalize everything, right? Uh, and so you have to put in a lot of parameters that you know about your detection system and everything else. but so it, w it was some effort to get this curve and then to assign using a um, uh, a sigma t to the fourth uh, and this was the intensity observed to convert that to a temperature so um, extremely useful but um, not necessarily super accurate but reasonable and so for instance this had to do a lot with the laser fusion program at livermore and this was showing what kind of temperatures that you got and that they were, you know, in the 200 EV region, it wasn't a kilovolt. What you weren't getting a kilovolt. You could get kilovolt x-rays, but that's not where all the energy was. The energy was uh, in the thermal part. Yeah. Oh, so here's another use of the street camera, uh, but using multi-layer mirrors. So this was actually done, it was part of a PhD thesis at UC Davis by Gary Stradling, and it had a lot of help from Troy Barbie, who provided the multi-layer mirrors at the time. But same kind of thing, just more channels. And then the trick, uh, the thesis involved matching up those multi-layer mirrors, which have reflectivity in a certain window at the angle they were used, matching them up with the target. So here's, the, here's, here's a target, laser light is coming in and the target has a plastic CH as the top layer, a fluoride layer after that, and then silicon dioxide uh, in the back. And these uh, multi-layer mirrors, their band passes were designed to match these things. So you could actually see if the laser light comes in and heats the CH, how fast does it propagate into the material? So this was something that hadn't been measured before. Um, and you could see in the streak records here, when did, this, when did the fluorine light up? And when did the silicon light up? Okay, and that gave you a good measure of thermal transport into a target. Whoops, there's nothing. Oh, so now we're gonna see some X-ray line emission stuff. So this is a slide we saw before, and basically that 
<coughs> for the same for the same atoms, let's say uh, all all titanium or all cobalt or something like or all silicon, uh, you you have um, the filled n equals one shell and the n equals two shell is partially filled and it's had um, different amounts of electrons removed just by how many collisions it's had with free electrons. So these are, these are uh, three different ionization levels that you could have. Eight electrons are gone, nine are gone, 10 are gone, and the energy levels shift a little bit, not a whole bunch, but they do shift. And as a result, when you then have <clears throat> one of these ions hit by another electron coming along and um, uh, exciting one of the valence n equals two electrons up to n equals three, and then the uh, then that uh, then the uh, the ion uh, um, adjust by dropping the electron down and throwing out a photon. Although they look like they're very similar systems, they all have the same nuclear charge. The photon energies that come out will be slightly different because the energy levels between n equals three and two are increasing a bit because there's more or less shielding of the nucleus. So we, we can expect to see that. And for instance, sometimes we don't want, sometimes we may not want all these different spectral emissions. We may only want one. So the trick will be, okay, let's, how could we eliminate some of these? Okay, so we only get one. So we'll take, I think that's coming up, but here's some examples. Uh, this is for chrome, chromium, excuse me again. Uh, so neon-like chromium, plus 14. So chrome, I guess, is 24. But if, it, if you remove the 10 electrons, this is what you've got, okay? This is the configuration of the ground state. And the ionization state is 1,000 eV, roughly, okay? Here's some conditions of a laser. This is a small laser. It fits in a small laser lab, okay? And... Um, and this is an observed spectrum. So this is not those crude uh, notch filters of mirror and reflector. This is a real grating is being used. And, um, and there's an iron L-edge filter there to give a, a marker. So we know what, where to put the, uh, the photon energies or wavelengths. And these are identified emission lines from chromium plus 14 or plus 15, so there's two different, those two different ionization states are clearly seen, and these are identified lines, and these are lines, and maybe there's gonna be a reference later, but for instance, the chemistry library has these three volumes where for all different ionization states, for all kinds of ions, it doesn't go up to uh, uranium, I don't think, but there are three volumes, I, have, I could reach them, they're behind me, you can look up these different lines and they just match up perfectly, okay? So this is a kind of X-ray emission that you could get. This is where there's a continuum emission that you can you know, see broadly here, but then superimposed on that are the line emissions. So the continuum again is the Bremsstrahlung from a, uh, those random electrons going near different ions, but at different impact parameters, different closeness, and therefore being accelerated more or less plus the electrons themselves have some energy spread. So the resultant accelerations <coughs> vary a lot. And that's why you get this broad continuum, all kinds of photon energies, which continue above here, but they've been cut off by this uh, iron uh, filter. And then again, superimposed is the line emissions. So um, this is an example of, um, well, this is for the chromium. Th these are the energies. What's shown here for each element, but let's say for chromium, are uh, uh, the ionization energy for, this is for, let's say, this is chrome with 11 electrons. We call it sodium light. This is chrome that's neon light, okay? It's lost 10 electrons. So this is neon light. That would be a closed shell, kind of hard to, to uh, uh uh, remove another electron. So for instance, you might have, um, well here, in this example here, chromium target with a peak black body intensity, just estimated from the intensity here, of 560 EV. So real easy to remove 
the 12th electron and then the 11th electron. Uh, to, and when you remove the 11th electron, it takes 384 EV. Well, you've got it. But now you've got, when you remove that 11th electron, you're in the neon-like state. And all of a sudden, it's not so easy to remove another uh, electron and go from uh, uh, a charge, an ion charge of 10 you know, to um, remove one more electron. So this would be an area where if you wanted only um, a few lines, you don't want this, uh, this zoo of lines, comb of lines, you could adjust your intensity and therefore, and therefore the, the black body temperature and therefore the peak, you could uh, control your intensity so that maybe you're a little bit less temperature than this and you wind up with just in a neon state. So you don't have a lot of different charge states. You'd have most of your ions in just a neon state and then you just have the neon lines to deal with. Uh, oh, here it is. Does it give the reference? No, it doesn't. Give me one second. So these are from this book. Where does it say Kelly? This is by the, this book by Kelly. Okay. And these books are in the chemistry library. And this is what you can look up for, er, for all of these different elements and their different charge states. So there'll be a, a, another page for nine electrons. And, and then you can see the emission lines and which ones are strong. And these are the lines that are indicated as have, are being strong. This is the transitions, and these match up with this, uh, with this stuff here. Those lines all match up very nicely. So you have some knowledge and control of how you can use your laser intensity to produce not only the continuum radiation, but emission lines that you're interested in. Oh, I finally found it. OK, so it was here. So they're called the Kelly tables. Um, this is about um, producing helium and hydrogen-like lines, and what what would be the transition energies that you can get? So let's. This is you've already done your work and you produced helium-like or hydrogen-like um, ions. But let's say helium-like is an interesting one because it's a closed shell, and titanium. I'm going to show you a result in a moment. Titanium has these these two lines at roughly 4.7 keV okay and so if you set your intensity right so that you can get to helium like titanium so that means you uh, you've got to remove 20 electrons and from the Kelly table you could look up what kind of energy it would require and then you'd set your intensity, just use that simple black body formula, you'll be pretty close. And then you play in your, uh, your lab to, to perfect it. Um, and those, by the way, these things are all in the book. Um, and then here's some, um, th this is an example uh, with silicon, SiO2, hitting a, a little glass tube at this intensity and there's the helium-like and the hydrogen-like lines are well identified. But uh, an interesting example is this one. So this is, um, this is our tit a titanium disc. Looks like a little lollipop, maybe has a diameter of maybe 200 microns, or illuminated at one micron at this intensity. Not so hard to do with that little laser lab, you can do this. And you can strip off enough electrons that you can get to helium like titanium, okay? And uh, this here is the helium like doublet, okay? And so it's producing these lines at 4.7 keV here. There are also other lines that appear, you know? Th these are alpha, there's beta and gamma, et cetera. Remember them from maybe early in the book where we looked at what those things meant, what was helium, what was hydrogen like, and helium like, and et cetera, et cetera. And there's also the 
the K alpha emissions. But anyway, this is extremely, it turns out to be an extremely powerful, it's easy to block these other wavelengths. You notice they're quite a bit higher and the others are weak. So it's pretty easy to get a really strong, uh, relatively well-defined wavelength, and you could use that then to probe some nearby plasma. So it's going to be, you're illuminating a disk, it's going to be radiating into roughly 2 pi, so maybe you'll only be able to capture a small part of that to make a probe, a plasma probe, but it works, okay? This, you can get so many photons. Okay. Any comment on this? Robert, you, Robert, were you going to talk about probing plasmas? No, no I was doing uh, Compton scattering. Oh, you're doing Compton, sorry. Yeah, that was me. Yeah. Okay, so what else do we want? Oh, yeah, so where are we on time? We have about 10 minutes. I, I'll just bring up, I'll start this topic, and then we'll finish it next time, and then we'll be done. But these, for instance, these are the... Uh, the fluid level equations describing a plasma, okay? The Maxwell's equations, continuity, which conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, the so-called momentum equation, um, showing it for different species. Electrons would be J equals one, uh, ions would be J equals two, um, et cetera. And so you'd have to write the, con the fluid equations, you'd have to write twice, once for electrons and once for ions, if it matters. If the ions are so heavy, maybe you only have to do it for the electrons. But what we're pointing out here is that the equations are not linear. There are product terms here, N and V. So if, for instance, somehow or other you increase the velocity and you increase the density, Things don't go up just linearly with velocity. If there's some link here, there's gonna, they're going to increase as some power. So not just linearly dependent on one parameter or the other. So you have to analyze this and figure, um, see how it, analytically, is there some way that you could linearize these equations or, or understand the nonlinear nature? So these are where nonlinear terms come. This is the J. NQV in the, the current density in Maxwell's equations, in the, um, the continuity equation, uh, there's a product of the electron density and velocity, divergence of NV. And then in the momentum equation, you have, a, you have several things here, but you have, you have a V and a V, V dot grad V, and you also have the density here. So you have a triple product here, and you have um, the Lorentz force also depends on N, E, and V. So if N is varying and E or B or E or V are also varying, these all give you a possibility of uh, some nonlinear terms. So when do they occur? They're going to occur in general when, for instance, the velocities are very strong. So for instance, if you had an electromagnetic wave coming in at very high intensity, so that the velocity was very large, and actually uh, it was large enough that there was some heating effect or some other effect where the electron density was also made to, to vary, not just the velocity or the velocity squared, that's an E squared term. So at strong enough intensity, the corresponding electric field could wind up driving some of these. And in the next class, we'll just give some examples of them. Um, uh, this is actually a convenient thing to end on. So this is some, here's some plasma. Here's some incident wave. It doesn't say incident, by the way. And here's uh, some other waves. They could be both electromagnetic. There could be one of them is a plasma wave. But somehow or other, there are three waves going on. And you fit them into these equations. And the J term that's driving Maxwell's equations, you write in this form, okay? But J is e minus E and V. And so here's the, the sort of basic electron density and that the electron density is also has some waveform to it. And the V term has some waveform to it. 
And so we've done this so many times before. For instance, again, this was, we did this for uh, the general scattering diagram in chapter three, and we showed that, for instance, uh, incident light, incident x-rays on a crystal um, produced a scattered wave, and we analyzed it the same way, and we got uh, the Bragg equation. So in general, for this to be true, there has to be a relationship between the frequencies and the k's. And this can be both linear and nonlinear. And in the last class, I showed a diagram like this, and I had one of them as omega incident, and one was a wave in the plasma, and one was a scattered wave. And I made a comment that I thought I had written uh, I had written omega incident equals, and I thought that was a mistake. And in fact, it was not a mistake. How how you write these depends a little bit. In the linear case, the incident wave scatters off a of plasma and gives the uh, scattered wave. So you would have this would be the scattered, the scattered wave vector and frequency depends on. Um, the scattered wave depends on the plasma, the incident wave plus the plasma wave. That would be the Bragg condition, where this is now the scattered wave, the reflected wave off the crystal. However, if it's a nonlinear process where this is really strong coming in, the incident wave evolves into two other waves. And so in that case, it is incident on this side. So at the linear level, it's scattered here. And on the nonlinear one, intense enough, this wave is devolving into two other waves. And so this would be the, um, the incident wave um, giving up its energy and all of that to produce two other waves. So the relationship works both ways. Ah, so this is a, this is a good one to end on. Um, if you have an electromagnetic wave in the plasma, it's going to make its electric field associated with the intensity, the electric field and the frequency are gonna to lead to an oscillating velocity for the electron. So the wave is coming through, maybe focused or maybe just passing through, makes the electrons oscillate up and down. So this would be what we would call the oscillating velocity amplitude vector actually. This is the oscillating velocity of all the electrons in the plasma. Okay, We'd like to compare it with the thermal energy. All of the different electrons running around interacting with each other, they're producing a certain pressure effect. Okay, And so there's a pressure associated with this, with this random thermal electron motion. It has kappa t in it, but we know from that we get a pressure. You can get a pressure out of this too. Some people call it the ponderomotive force, okay? But uh, if you square this, you'll also get a pressure out of this. And so uh, one important measure of whether you should expect to see some of these nonlinear effects is to form the, uh, the amplitude squared, which would be an energy kind of thing, and energy and pressure are just ones per unit volume of the other, but the Vos over V thermal, this is a thermal block, that's squared, you just put these parameters in, this is what you get, and you can rewrite that as the intensity divided by C divided by this, essentially a pressure here, a critical density kappa Te. And so, um, but intense, we can, we can replace this, we could work with this one. This is an intensity, right? This is a this is a one over lambda squared. I bet the next to, no, it doesn't have it. I should have put in here. This gives you this is proportional to I lambda squared. How much time and what can I possibly do here? Ah. I can't go backwards. Why not? Well, it's stuck. Yeah, so this thing would be, where am I? This thing would be proportional to I lambda 
squared. And so this is, a, this is going to give you uh, a measure of when you're going to see some of these nonlinear effects occurring. And it would be interesting, we didn't do this last year, but it'd be interesting to see for Bella, what, what is this nonlinear parameter here? Because what this is telling you is if the intensity, if the intensity is strong enough, meaning the electric field is high enough, the pressure associated with this oscillating electrons, it's a real pressure. It will push the plasma out of the way, okay? And there is, I may show some slide next time. I forget if it's in the package. But anyway, you're comparing a pressure associated with the, oscillate, with the oscillation driven by the incident field with the thermal velocity. So, uh, and you can, the plasma, if you get this number up of order one, this, this uh, pressure associated with the, the incident radiation, which again is often called a pondromotive force, will actually push the plasma out of the way. I'll show you a picture uh, of how, where this is actually observed. But in, uh, for instance, in Bella, you really have a very strong nonlinear effect where you push the plasma out of the way in these bubbles. So it'd be interesting if somebody could comment on that uh, next time. And uh, I'll leave it at that. The, in the next class, we'll look at some, case, some things called Brillouin scattering and Raman scattering, where the incident laser is so intense that it produces either a high frequency plasma wave, electron acoustic wave, or a low frequency ion acoustic wave, okay, which we didn't study, but we can understand that. You make the vector scattering diagrams for these, and you just then you find that for strong enough intensity, you can actually produce waves, and the waves can be a very high amplitude, and they can have a phase velocity which is quite high approaching the speed of light. And if it does, if it's high amplitude and high phase velocity, it can trap electrons in those, in those um, crests of the wave and accelerate electrons. And this is where the, uh, this is where the, the, the fraction of an MeV electrons get produced um, with, an, for instance, a, a laser fusion type situation. So, okay, so we'll go back to this next time. We'll do a little bit on those high harmonics and um, there's a little bit more material, but we'll be done with the plasma chapter. So if anyone has any questions or comments, you can send me an email about things that you'd like me to comment on in the next class. I think we'll have enough time. And for those of you who didn't have a strong interest in plasmas, thank you for bearing with us. Okay. Oh, we were supposed to go back. I'm going to close this one so that we could go back to that homework problem that we were asked about. Okay, so give me a second. Um, ah, what happened here? Um, give me a second to check on that homework problem. So that was 7.6, right? Yes. Um, so actually, I actually saw that Devon earlier sent that, like he's going to send out clarification on uh -huh. this. So um, yeah, I think if you have time, um, maybe you can go over it. But if you don't have time, that's fine too. I think Devon can send out, um, he's going to send out clarification anyway. So. Um, yeah. Let me give me just a second here. Okay, so I wonder.
Hey. It appears that this works. So can you see this, the 7.6? Yeah. Okay, so estimate the relative spectral bandwidth of a uh, bandwidth of a mid-range uh, harmonic. We did that. That was the, the product. And there is a slide in this, there are some slides in this chapter that we use, which basically says that this is why, that it's the product of um, the, the number of uh, cycles of the infrared laser and then of, the harm, of that particular harmonic number. Okay. Okay. So that would give you, okay. Then what does it say? Model the resulting electric field wave train, rectangular or Gaussian. It turns out full width half max will be pretty much similar. So it doesn't matter which one you do. And then apply a Fourier transform to the time domain. Well, you don't actually have to do that. I think for us, we know that if we have this wave train, we expect to have, let's say, Again, just to make up an example, if the infrared pulse was 10 cycles, the Thai sapphire was 10 cycles, and we were looking at the 41st harmonic, H, then we would say that the bandwidth is 1 over 10 times 41, so 1 over, four, one over 410, and so approximately 1 over 400. And so you would, I think to answer this last part, you would say if I drew, you could actually draw, something where there's an electric field oscillating up and down. There's a wave train, which has an electric field, and it should be 410 cycles long. And you could just say that if I did a Fourier transform of that, I'm going to see a bandwidth of roughly 1 over 400. Remember, we had a, a slide that showed that um, uh, the Fourier transform, I, which chapter? It was in the synchrotron chapter which had to do with um, the undulator radiation, what kind of bandwidth do we expect it to have? But anyway, that's all you would have to do there is just say that if I draw uh, a wave train, which now has 410 cycles to it, if I did a Fourier transform to that, I would expect the bandwidth to be one over 410, something like that, approximately. You know, there was some, there was a coefficient in there, 0 0.85 or something. But I think that's all you need to do. So give me some feedback. Was that understandable? Yeah, Over thank here. you. It works? Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, great. And are you getting the solutions to all of the problems after each? Yeah? I think so, yeah. Okay, and then um, for those who came, um, for those who came in late, so, it, um, after the next lecture, we'll give some homework assignment for the plasmas. But I'll only make it like two problems. Actually, for the plasma people, if you tell me, we could pick some other problems. Or you, you could even pick them together. But maybe the three of you who are interested in plasmas could do a little bit more homework because you would find it interesting. But you can look, on, you can look and see what, if you look at the, the Cambridge website, you'll see all the homeworks there. Um, but anyway, any rate, for, I think for everyone in the class, you just have to have, we'll, we'll, we'll pick two problems, okay, that will illustrate something. And then we're going to have, uh, I think, two lectures on the lasers, the EUV um, lasing in a plasma, but it's atomic ionic lasing. So it's an atomic laser. So we'll have two lectures and again, a short homework problem. And then there'll be I think two lectures on optics and imaging. And again, we'll just pick two problems. I'm, th I'm thinking that they would be, there's some really simple things you can do with the zone plates. And it's quite surprising how simple that works out. Okay. So today is Thursday. So I guess I'll see you Tuesday. Okay. It would be great if I heard from the plasma people about uh, is this satisfactory for you? Is this enough plasma physics? And um, um, any issues you have or would like addressed? And um, what about the homework problems? You just want to do two problems like every all the others, or do you have some input? Okay, so see you all on Tuesday.